church. It's your service. And we are your people. Have your way in this service. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. in front of pastors, you know, so it's still in front of you, <laughs> right, <laughs> so we'll continue in our teachings um, for the month, and um, last week we taught a sermon titled, When Love Seems Unfair, that's on YouTube, um, I recommend that you go to it and watch it again, if you were in the service, watch it again and again and again. 
So you know what that means for you if you were not in the service, right? Watch it times 10, right? Um, please. I, I feel the need to remind us this year that it's important to feed on God's word, right? Uh, Jesus said when Satan was tempting him in Matthew 4, man shall not live by bread alone, right? He was quoting from Deuteronomy. I'm not sure if it's 18 now. He was quoting from there and said, but by every word that goes out of the mouth of God, that's what should sustain a man. And we've explained many times that food feeds your physical body. There's something that feeds your soul, and it's that one. And so do you ever wonder why when you want to go listen to a sermon, um, you don't see the duration there. You see it's one hour. You're like, one, one hour of my life. No way. But then a basketball game comes up. A soccer game comes up. And that thing that told you that one hour was long goes asleep that moment. Right? And then you watch the first half. The 15 minutes in between, you stay there. You watch the analysis. Then you watch the second half. Then you complain that the time I did done was not enough. It should have been more. And it's when you want to do those things, you don't get that check in you that says, oh, it's too long. But when you want to listen to God's word, when you want to study, that's when you get busy. I need you to recognize that it's a trap. <laughs> There's something fighting you feeding your soul. Right? Sometimes we get blessed and we have a whole lot going on and we don't know it's a big trap. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 13 when he was talking about the parable of the sower and he said that some people will receive God's word and immediately that seed you know, that falls on very shallow soil. It says immediately it springs. And that's what happens. You leave church on a Sunday, you feel pumped, you feel good. But because, as Jesus said, it had no depth, no root in itself. At the first challenge, it disappears. And I'm sure I've said here before how in, in our church in Nigeria, people would finish service. We used to have parking issues. People would finish service and start throwing punches at the car park. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Someone would want to park somewhere. The traffic officials would say, you can't park here and all that. One man came to them and said, let me rush into the service. After service, you see what I'll do to you. And apparently because he was a man of integrity, he actually did come back <laughs> to do that thing. Right? Yes. So we can go to church and come back and there's no much going on in us. Not much difference in us. And it is because we don't have depth in ourselves. And it's one of the ways to do it. We talked about patterns last week. We talked about patterns when we were teaching a vision as well. We must arrest the patterns in our lives and change them to something that will build us into who we need to be. So you might want to start with, apart from Sunday service, I watch at least one sermon a week. And then two sermons a week. In some other cases, put it on, let it play in your room while you do other things. Amen. I know it's not exciting, yes. The things that grow your soul actually are not fun. I promise you. And so if you're looking for fun, you are not likely to find it here. I, I did say some weeks ago that I apologize for everyone who's preached convenient Christianity to us and told us that once you give your life to Christ this Christianity will be done on your terms and God will adjust to you. <laughs> right? I know it's in church you do all that. It shifts, shifts, shifts. You know? It shifts. So let, let people come so that you know whatever it is you know, yeah. We say come as you are so that God can touch you. Yes, right? So that's important. The things that feed your soul may not look like fun. So fight it. Okay? I've never met a person that said fasting is my hobby. It's not fun. Studying, it's not fun. When you open your Bible to read, then different things begin to come. Some of us go on our knees to pray, and the moment we hit the floor, other thoughts come. Right? And then you get up. 
and decide this thing is not for me. It's for you. Okay? Spiritual growth is a matter of practice. It's an exercise. Okay? So, just keep at it. I thought I'd mention that. So, we have all these sermons on the church YouTube page or my YouTube page. You can always go there and watch them again and again. And on Wednesdays, Bible study, right? It's 8 p.m. on Zoom. It's always refreshing, right? It's always very beautiful if you've been there. So, yes, make make it a date as well. Um, do we have our spoons today? Yes. And so, we mentioned last week, I think, that we, of course, the church has, for over a year, um, bought subscription with Right Now Media. So, that's like a bank, a YouTube um, kind of thing for Christian content demographics right so uh, so we have a page there we would usually um, get stuff from there and because we've subscribed everyone here can actually gain access to it through PCG right so um, we have a banner out there with a barcode that you can scan it takes you straight to that page you put your details there and you can always access it at any time at no cost to you because church has taken care of that right um, normally, it should be good news. People are looking at me like it's not good news. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay? It is food for the soul. And the soul is very important. Right? Very important. If you faint in the day of adversity, the strength is small. There is something that should sustain you. If that thing is weak, you just find yourself going from one extreme to the other someone smiles at you today, it's your happiest day. The next minute, someone says something bad, it's your worst day. And you just keep going like that. No substance. Everything blows you because you're not feeding properly. Right? That was not the sermon for the day. But things are just happening today, right? But in case that's what someone needs to hear, please hold on tight to it. Okay? Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 from verse 25 to 37. That's, that's a bit of a long read, but um, we speak through it. It should be on the screen in a moment, but I will start and then um, you can join me and as usual, we all read together. Right? Luke 10, 25 to 37. While we're trying to pull it up on the screen, if you have... Um, the Bible on your phone, or you have the good old art copy one, please let's do this together. Let's read together. One to go. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two dinari, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So I titled this sermon, Love is an Action Word. Love is an action word. Okay, in um, two days, 
the word love will suffer its annual catastrophe. <laughs> yes. It's, it's an annual problem for it, right? When, when we all express what we think it is, right? Each one. Um, sometimes we hear the plans people have for Valentine's and all that. This, this should not be love. For some, it's about um, making somebody else bankrupt, right? If you if you love me, you will buy this thing, sell your destiny, <laughs> and buy it, right? Okay, love um, is one of the most bastardized words, right? And one of the biggest confusions about it is its very nature, right? What's the nature of love? What's love indeed for some people it's that uncontrollable feeling that you have you know that consequently leads to a set of actions that's when you fall in love right the interesting thing is some of us fall in love for a living you know yes i had a friend who also said to me it doesn't take me long to fall in love i just fall yeah yeah, but that, that's not such a bad thing. After all, the Bible says seven times a righteous man falls. Each time he gets up, that's the problem, right? And so people fall and get up, fall and get up, just like that, right? For others, it's simply a position um, in which we're not harming anyone. After all, I'm not doing any evil to anybody, so it means I love, right? Um, and then there are the people for whom love is a response to your constant and consistent good behavior towards them. And so for those people, I mean to love you because you do these things, you do these things, you do these things, right? Yes, and I really cannot stand here and say any of those definitions is wrong because they are all experiences that we have in love. But in this case, uh, there's something slightly different in the way Jesus captures it in this story, right? And so the Bible says that the experts in the law had come to him and said, so how do I gain eternal life? And Jesus had said to him, so what's in the law, right? What's your reading of it? And the man said, well, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your might, all your strength. He said, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that would prove to you that the man was really an expert in the law because there were ten commandments as we put it, you know, and then other laws in the Old Testament, there were ceremonial laws and the rest of them, over 600 of them. And this man obviously was an expert because he managed to just summarize everything into two. Good guy. He was ready for Jesus too. And so when he said those, Jesus said, you are right. And then the guy was like, not so fast. Who then is my neighbor? And I see where he was coming from because the original or the first place that instruction was given to love your neighbor as yourself is in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. The instruction there was about being vengeful and bearing grudges. What God had said was you shall not plan revenge against your neighbor or bear a grudge against them, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so it means, again, just like most of the instructions in Leviticus 19, all the laws that God gave to those people were for their neighbors, their fellow Jews. Thou shalt not kill was one of the laws. But you know one of the things that got Saul into trouble? He did not kill. He didn't kill Agag. Right? That was it. God would give them instructions. I have handed these people over to you and you shall kill all of them. Wipe everything. If you don't wipe them, you're in trouble with me. So that's killing. So essentially, the instruction is thou shalt not kill one of your own. You are a special people. So don't hurt one of your own. That was the background for that commandment. So you'd understand when the expert of the Lord then comes to Jesus and says, okay, now I need to make sense of this. Who is my neighbor? For our benefit, Jesus decided to tell his story. Because in many 
cases, the things he says we may not remember, but those stories we remember them. And so people that have not talked the Bible in a billion years know what it means to be a good Samaritan. And it's from here. And so Jesus says to them that a certain man was going between Jerusalem and Jericho. And it was interesting that he used that location because according to Bible historians, that place was porous. It was terrible. It was where people would pass through. They were going to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem. And there were, um, what? Merchandise, plenty of it in the temple. You remember that Jesus had to go and throw away those, those people, right? And so people would usually carry money because they'd get to the temple if you need to buy a dove, buy a pigeon, buy a ram, something to sacrifice. And so people would usually have money. And so this guy was passing through at that time and robbers met him and did what they do best, right? And left him for dead. He then explains that the first person to pass was a priest, a pastor, if you will. And the gentleman of God looks at him and says, not today, Satan. Not today. I have my plans for the day. And in fairness, he didn't kick him. He didn't insult him. He only crossed and moved on and conducted his service at 9.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Right? And then the second one was a Levite. They were usually in charge of worship. Fola, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'd also passed and maybe in our world, it then recognizes, oh, pity must have crossed there and gone. I can't be late for service. And then crosses and goes. And then the third person that passed, and Jesus was very deliberate in this story, was the third person that passed was a Samaritan. And that was the only time he mentioned who that person was, the nationality and all of that. That was the only time he mentioned it. Because Samaritans were looked down on by the Jews. And it was all from the Old Testament when the Assyrians captured northern Israel. The capital of northern Israel was Samaria, the ten tribes of Samaria. They captured it, captured other places as well and took their captives from those places to Samaria. And so it became um, because the Jews were special people. And so for them if you are in Samaria it means you've been diluted. Because they then started to intermarry and all that. And so the Samaritans would want to say they were Jews, but then the Jews would tell them they were fake. Which was the reason in John 4, that woman was saying to Jesus, you, should, you can't be talking to me. You know? But at the same time, she was arguing about where to worship God. So they also worshipped God, but they were deemed inferior. And so Jesus then tells us that it is that one that comes and helps the guy. And so, what does love mean to Christ? By this story, that's what I want us to look at and I will run, gosh. What does love mean to Jesus? As we usually do here, if it's your first time, I would usually, you know, itemize what I want to say so that it's easier to document, you know, and you can always look through it. But I'll say some things about what I think is the kind of love Jesus was talking about here. And the first thing about it is that it's not always convenient. It's not always convenient. In fact, maybe I can say it's hardly convenient. But maybe it's easier for us to bear. It's not always convenient, right? Okay? And so when he says to love, as it occurred to you that you only give instructions when that person's natural inclination doesn't go in that direction. I'll explain. If you have a child who loves gadgets, you typically won't have to instruct them to go and carry it. Is that right? Your instruction would be more along the lines of don't touch that thing. If you touch it and I catch you, you are in trouble. And then most of the time, they will accidentally touch it. That's what instructions are for. When he says, husbands, love your wives, it's because after a while, as husband and wife, that love won't come naturally anymore. Because before you got married, love was blind. By the time honeymoon is happening, 
healing happens straight. Your blindness is cured. Your eyes open. And so he said, husbands love your wives. So it became an instruction within marriage. I will talk about that much later. Because an instruction within marriage, not pre-marriage. Because that time you were doing midnight call. You, you know, they didn't need to preach it to you. No, no, no. Then I'll, I'll see you off. Then you see me off. Then I'll see you off. Then you see me off. But that annoying one that telecoms networks liked. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Nonsense. <laughs> so at that time, they, they didn't need to teach love to you. You were in love. And then you get married. And a few months later, then that instruction now becomes valid. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your own husband. Because at that time, you have seen that this guy doesn't have plenty sense. <laughs> yes. Like, it's, it's, the, it's the truth for many of us. Man of God, I'm sure it's not for you. It's not for many. But for many of us, after a while, at times my wife looks at me and wonders. <laughs> Where did I find him? But that's the beauty of the Lord. She's stuck. Yeah. So, God is good. Yes. <laughs> so, instructions come because your natural inclination would not go in that direction. And so, when he says to love, and that was what the expert, the law expert wanted to clarify, because to love the people around me, to love the people that are close to me, to love the people that are good to me shouldn't be difficult. But the vibes you are giving is like that's not enough. So who is my neighbor really? And he was saying it's that one that is lying by the road. When you are attempting to attend to him will alter your day. And some of us like control. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people don't, don't throw me off balance. No. I know how I want my day to go. I've planned all of it. It doesn't always work, but I still plan it. Right? I've planned all of it. And there are times when what you say is just five minutes becomes too expensive. Because within that time, I don't have the space for it. I can be like that. And then you're walking and you have planned it. And then you see someone. And you know that with this person, my plan for the day has changed. That's not convenient. And that's what love is. Sometimes it's not time, it's budget. Like this money, nothing can take it. And then the need shows up. Okay? And so Jesus was teaching about love and he gave such an inconvenient example. And said, be like that person. Forgive me, I will run a bit. I need to. The second one, loving the Lord does not always translate into loving people. The first two people to pass by who saw that stricken man were a priest and a Levite. They were the ones in charge of worship. And so they had to, whether they loved the Lord from their heart or by compulsion, they had to do one. They had to. When they went into the holies of all, it was dangerous. And so Bible scholars would say, that back then, when a priest got into the holies of all, they would usually tie a rope around his ankle. Because all of them could not go in. And after a while, if they are not hearing from the man inside, they will pull that rope a bit. If the man responds inside, oh, he's still alive. Because they did, God could have done anything to him. <laughs> right? Just one punch from God will turn your life around, you know? And so, these people always had to be prim and proper and live for the Lord. Maybe not because they loved the Lord. Maybe because they didn't want to die. Whatever. But they had to be prim and proper. And so these were prim and proper people going to spend time with God and not recognizing the God on the ground. If you've read Matthew 25, where Jesus was talking about the surprises that will happen on the last day, he said he would tell them Go away from me. I don't know you. You're a worker of iniquity. For I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. I was naked, you didn't close me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And all of that. And not once did I see anything about how well you speak in tongues. And how well you dance in church. And how early you come. 
that, that's not to say she'll come early. I say, even the pastor said, <laughs> no, that's not what I said. Come early, please. No, I apologize. <laughs> but those were not the deal breakers for the Lord there. Because those people then asked him, so when did we see you in those states? And didn't help, he said, as long as he didn't do it for any of the least of these people. It's a big deal. My pastor would always say there will be surprises in heaven. Because even the ones he now told, come in. If I was hungry, you fed me. Was, those ones still asked him. When, when did that happen? Even they were not expecting to get him. Yeah, it can be like that. So Jesus was saying to them, it's good that you love me. It's good that you worship. It's good that you praise. But I have representatives around you in pain. And I need you to do something about them. Okay? The third one. You cannot love and be unconcerned. You cannot. It's the concept of love that some of us have had. As long as I'm not harming you, we are fine. Right? But that's not what the Lord is talking about here. Because the first two did not harm the guy. But again, for the believer, it appears that when you are not helping where you can help, you are harming. And in the law of this country and many other countries, you know it's there, that when you see someone, an accident victim or something, you can't actually walk away. You cannot love and be unconcerned. You cannot say you love someone and you won't do anything about it. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's it. Love has to trigger something in you. I'm talking to the people of God. God's children. You really must be stretching out your hand and making things happen for people. You have to. I would usually say someone has to be thanking God for you. Someone has to be somewhere saying, I, I'm grateful for this person. I don't know what it is you might be giving to them. But we'll say, we've said a billion times here, your life is too small to be the center focus of your life. If someone needs something. And you cannot claim to love God's way and be unconcerned about it. Right? And then the next one, your neighbor, which was what that, that expert of the law learned. Proximity does not define your neighbor. Need does. It's not proximity. Oh, I live in Northwest. You live in Southeast. You can't be my neighbor. No. Okay. It's not proximity here. It is need whoever you come in contact with that needs something you can give becomes your neighbor in that moment. That's what that story tells us. So you might want to think about how many neighbors you actually meet every week. Those are your neighbors. You probably find it easier using the location thing to define neighbors. After all, all your neighbors are rich. <laughs> and no one's asking you for anything, but actually you hardly find a human being that is rich in everything. But that's, that's a topic for another day. I haven't found one human being that needs absolutely nothing. The only problem is that we define success only by the material. The person drives the finest cars, has the biggest house, and you think all is well with them, and many of them are dying inside. And it never occurs to us to be there for them, especially when we have access. So you see someone that seems to have more money than you and all you think is how to get from them. And I heard a big pastor in Nigeria say to me once that it's, it's a problem I have. No one comes to me to say, how can I help you? How can I be there for you? Like, no, no one does. And so the moment he sees people in his mind, they are here to take. 
they are here to take. They are here to take. And many rich people around us feel that way, you know. Someone said, if you, if you know up to five stingy people, that means you beg too much. <laughs> for, that, for some of us, we say, all my uncles are stingy. All my aunties are stingy. Everyone is stingy. And you have never offered anybody anything, but you are not stingy. No. The moment you give your life to Christ, you became someone put in charge of huge treasure. There are things you can give, but unfortunately, as long as it's not affecting your bank account, it's nothing to you. And that's the error. So your neighbor is not defined by location, but by need. Right? And I'll stop it on this last one. And I need someone to pick it, because I think it will answer questions for many people. Love does not mean relationship. And I'll explain that in a bit. Love and relationship are two different things. You are to love everyone. You are not to build relationships with everyone. I hope you understand that. And I'll break it down. So this man, the Samaritan, carried this guy, took him to the innkeeper, said, take care of him. I am going my way. Did you notice that there? When I'm on my way back, if you have spent more than I gave you, I will balance it up for you. I did not read, and I've read it in different translations. I did not read one place where he took him home. I did not read one place where he said, I have helped you, therefore you have become my next of kin. Sometimes learn to help people and let go. Some of us are still mad because we helped somebody in 2013. Until today, they have not shown gratitude. See, you reap what you sow, not where you sow. Some people pay it forward. And some don't pay it forward. It's not you they owe, actually. Let's go. You help someone, so the person has to stay close to you, so the person has to be around you, so the person has to, you know, run by every word you say, then you're going to have problems. Sometimes you call people in grades, but it's you not moving on. Help and move on. And that's why we said it's not defined by proximity. They don't have to stay close. In that moment, you help them. Move on. Love doesn't mean relationships. And if someone has helped you before, blessed you before, and you know that that relationship has run its course, but you are there out of gratitude. When you are in their presence, you smile. When they leave, you cry. Love doesn't mean relationships. No. The instruction is to love everyone. Building relationships with people has to be a very deliberate thing. Because the closest people to you will determine how you move in life. And so if you help someone, let them go. If someone's helped you, be grateful to them, but you don't have to stay there. It's the reason some of us find it difficult helping people that are not believers. Because you don't want to build a relationship. You don't have to. But in that moment that they have needs, that person is your brother. That person is your neighbor right there. When they are fine, move on. Have you ever rescued a bird before? Yes. The moment that bird is fine, goes. If you like, fly, follow it. <laughs> Love doesn't mean relationships. And that was why Jesus used the Samaritan. Because the Samaritans and the Jews were not going to be together. From every indication, the guy that was wounded was Jewish. And that Samaritan guy knew that they couldn't build a relationship. They certainly could not have built a relationship. But he helped. And they moved on. You have to do that. Give to people what they need that you have the capacity to give and move on from there. It's a wisdom that prevents a whole lot of bitterness. 
Some people also ask, what of those that are what beginning to take you for granted? And I've seen some of that. Someone comes to me and says he has a need. He calls the amount of that need. I've never seen it before. I've been joking with some friends. I, I asked them, do I have money somewhere that I don't know? Because the kind of money some people have asked me for recently. I think God told them something he didn't tell me. Right? Yes. And so, sometimes, people obviously begin to take advantage. And it's because even you don't know when to move on. You don't know when to disengage. You don't know when to move on. Sometimes, people ask for money. It's wisdom they need. Yes. Sometimes it's wisdom they need. Sometimes it's money. I'm not saying everybody that asks for money lacks wisdom. No. <laughs> but sometimes it's wisdom. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's support. Sometimes it's just your presence. But give whatever it is the Lord has put within your capacity and move on. That may be something someone needs to hear. Let people go. That you helped them does not mean you own them. They don't have to be with you. I finished. <laughs> My prayer to God is that as we go through the teachings this month, we will see love the way he does. We will love people indeed. By virtue of our love, lives around us will be transformed. People will get better and better. People will, through us, know the love of Christ. And that in loving people, we will not be empty. We will not feel unloved. And that as we are blessings to many people, those that should be blessings to us will show up. In the name of Jesus. And above all, we will know the love of Christ. Apostle Paul said that we may know the height and the depth and the width of God's love. It is massive. And I pray for everyone here. In the name of Jesus, you will know that love. You will constantly be reminded that you are special. You will be reminded every day that you are blessed. In the name of Jesus. This new week... I call you blessed. I call you favored. I declare that the lines are falling to you in pleasant places. You have a goodly heritage in the name of Jesus. This week, you will go to the right places. You will meet the right people. You will say the right things in the name of Jesus. This week, when you call on God, he will answer. When you go on your knees to pray, you will feel that connection with him. When you read the Bible, the word will open up to you. Your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walking is. You won't lack direction. In the name of Jesus, I declare concerning everyone in your family, everyone in your house, I call each one blessed. This week, if you cry, it will be tears of joy. It is well with you. I pray concerning your relatives back in Nigeria or anywhere in the world. Anytime you hear from them, it will be for good. In the name of Jesus, no evil will befall you. No plague will come near your dwelling. I declare this new week for someone, it will be your best week yet this year. Your testimonies will be many. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Can we be on our feet as we bring the service to a close?